Hello and welcome to Giant Mess, a sloppy sports and entertainment talk show that's all over the map. We cover Giants football, Mets baseball, movies, TV shows, and we tell funny stories and life lessons along the way. It's hosted by Giant Mess. That's me, the real cinch, Neil Lynch. I'm a former college quarterback and pitcher turned over thinker and kind of a stinker. On today's episode, I'm going to recap my week-long trip down to South Carolina to visit fr- uh, family, who are also friendly. So I guess you could call them friends as well. I went down with the little one, and we got a lot of pool time in. Oh, what a week. Watched a few movies while I was down there, so we'll do some mini reviews of The Outlaws 65, starring Adam Driver. And they clone Tyrone, kind of uh, underrated sci-fi conspiracy thriller that dropped on Netflix to little to little buzz, and that's because it's probably because of Barbie and Oppenheimer just dominating all kinds of movie news. But they clone Tyrone. Got to see it, so we'll do a mini review of that. So without further ado, after that record length intro let's get started as i mentioned i went down to south carolina to visit family my sister and my mother live down there sister's family three kids my brother-in-law and uh went down with my daughter four years of age we go down there she goes down there probably like three maybe three weeks out of the year i want to say two or three weeks out of the season out of the, out of the year and the other 50 weeks or so, she's talking about going down there. So <laughs> I think she likes it down there. We, uh, She's becoming quite the pro on the plane and, and the airport situation. It's just like I have little to no worries about her, um, you know, being able to handle it. You know, the the how she devours snacks is getting out of control. I know that much. Like I packed a full on giant Ziploc bag of pirate booty, cereal, cereal bars. What else? Apple sauce. No, it was on the way back. Just, a, it's just all kinds of snacks, Oreos, Fig Newtons. She demolished them. All of it. All of it. <laughs> It was supposed to be, I packed the bag so it's like, okay, you can have half on the way down and then on the way back, you can have the other half. And uh, nope, she's like, I'm, I'm fine with just destroying all this right now at the gate. So <laughs> that was cool. Uh, lots of friendly people in Philly. We actually flew out of the Philly airport this time. It's not the first time we've flown out of the Philly airport. But this one, this go around, there was just lots of friendly people. I don't know what was going on, what was in the air, what was in the water. It was a little offsetting because I was like, what's going on here? Is this a con? Am I about to be shanked? What's what like am I is this a trap? But uh no, I mean the you know, a woman on the the complimentary bus shuttle from the economy parking was just like sitting across from us and she's like, Oh, that's you know, because my daughter ha- carries her bunny, which I think is a dog that she named Bunny. You know, it's just a little, little blanky stuffed animal type thing. We've all had one. I had one. So she, uh, she's like, oh, what's your bunny's name? Oh, it's Bunny. <laughs> Outrageous. So that one was pretty nice. And, uh, and then the woman behind us in the security line was also nice. Like, hey, where are you going? going to, oh, you going to see family? Just, just like chatting her up. I'm like, oh, okay, this is interesting. I think, are they just trying to put my daughter at ease because they can see how nervous and anxious I am? <laughs> is that what's trying to? Is that's what the, that's what the whole motivation behind that is? Cool, cool. I get it. TSA. I, I don't know what's going on with the TSA. I, I like. It's annoying, but I get it. You know, it's like they had to put. Speaking of bunny, they had to put bunny through the machine. To the freaking x-ray machine. That's where we're at. We have to th- run stuffed animals through the x-ray machine. I mean, yeah, diabolical. Diabolical. If that's your plan, diabolical. Really? You know, hiring a four-year-old or even using your own four-year-old daughter as a as a decoy 
and trying to smuggle in some kind of weaponry in a stuffed animal. Kudos, my man. So that was a little weird, running Bunny through the machine. It's like if Bunny were packed in the suitcase that I checked, this wouldn't have been a problem. If Bunny was just in one of the bags that I, uh, one of the, you know, backpacks, that, you know, I brought two backpacks. If Bunny's in the backpack, are they going to pull the bunny out and run that through the machine? What's going on? It's a bunny. Honey. And then, of course, they pulled out the bottle of Detangler hairspray, if you're not familiar, because I didn't know what Detangler was before I had a, a daughter. But spray, spray the long hair, and it's supposed to help when you brush it to get all the knots and tangles out or whatnot. Uh, kind of works, you know? It's more like a placebo at this point, <laughs> I feel like. It just basically tears my daughter's hairs out by the roots, which she enjoys to a great degree. So, uh, yeah, he's like, oh, is this, your, is this yours? And he holds up this tall green bottle, which was not full and probably had less than three and a half ounces of fluids in it. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, got to toss it. And I'm like, all right, Rambo, appreciate that. Thanks for just calling that out to everyone in the security line. I, you know, uh, it's just an act of power, I guess. A gesture of authority. So, I mean, I yeah, I guess if you work at the TSA long enough, you just get this air of superiority, you know? And you're just like, I'm just going to see how far I can flex this thing. How far can I bend people's willingness to tolerate my assholery? <laughs> I don't know. So uh, we did get to play cornhole at the airport. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I don't know if they have cornhole at the Newark airport. <laughs> it just seems like, uh, I hate to say it, as a New York sports fan and knowing that most Philly sports teams, if not all the Philly sports teams, are basically rivals of my favorite teams. Philly's got a pretty decent airport. I don't hate it. And I, I dare I say it's better than Newark. I mean, if just the fact that they have cornhole, I think that's that's, that's that was that's what sold me on uh, on them being better. But as as like ten minutes into playing cornhole, I'm like feeling the the beanbag, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh man, how many people have touched this? And do you think that they wash these every night? You know, it's amazing how. I went from like hyper paranoid, anxious, you know, um, getting like stress blisters all over my body over COVID and just like, oh, we can't go outside. We can't breathe the air. We can't look at anyone to uh, I'm playing cornhole that I don't think has ever been cleaned in 15 years. <laughs> it's just like, and let's just go ahead and lick our hands to get extra grip on the bag. So yeah, I was just like, you know what? I don't, let's just roll the dice. You know, it's like her mom has pretty good. Um, what do you call it? <sighs> immunity. I don't, but the mother does. So maybe she'll inherit the the mother's immunity. I mean, Brie already has has had a like smoker's cough for the past year. No, month. And I'm like, you gotta lay off the menthols, my man. That's what little get you. Flew American Airlines, which uh, you know I have this, the ban on Spirit Airlines, so we flew uh, American Airlines, which is uh, not too shabby. It's a step up from Spirit. I can tell you that goddamn much. And it's not even really American Airlines. I think it's American Eagle, which is a subsidiary of American Airlines, and they don't have like the full blown planes. They're they're like Airbuses. I guess that's what you call it, an Airbus. Where it's like, you know, I kind of got a little sent for, sent for a loop, if you will. I got a little shock to the system because when I got my boarding passes, I was, I didn't, I didn't select seats, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm a pretty risk averse dude, but, uh, you know, I've been reading that like most airlines, when they see you have a child, they will put you, assign you a seat next to the child, right? You don't have to worry about purchasing seats, you know, so I was like, I'm not going to purchase seats. You know, roll the dice. They'll figure it out. Four-year-old, they know to sit her next to the guardian, right? So then I get the boarding pass and I see, uh, you know, 8A, 
an 8C. And I'm like, oh, no. Because I was thinking, you know, most airplanes, it's ABC on one side and DEF on the other side. You know, three seats on, on each side of the aisle. And so I'm like, oh, do I have to go up to the gate? And do I have to ask them, like, hey, can you sit us next to each other? Can you ask the person sitting in the in the middle, the bitch, if you will, in, you know, 8B, if she can just, like, move over one? And I'm like, ah, you know what? I just we'll just get on the plane and I'll work it out on the plane. And then I see the plane and I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Huh. Interesting. Smaller than I thought. And then I get on the plane and it's like, ah, okay. There's two seats on each side of the aisle. <laughs> why they do why they do that, I guess aisle and window, they have to be A and C. It can't just be like, oh, A and B. That that just throws me off. And I think that throws a lot of people off. I don't think I'm the only one. You know, the fact that it's not D, E, F, it's D and F and A and C. There's no B's. There's no E's. <sighs> Our seats were weird, though, because we were like the first seats in economy class, like not first class. So there's last row of first class, then boom, us. So, but the first class seats, they make sure to <laughs> separate them as much as possible from the business uh, economy class or whatever. Second class, third class. Are we third class now? So, like, and there's only one seat, right? Because in the in that business class, first class, they have the two big seats on the right and the one big seat on the left of the aisle. So we're sitting behind the one big seat, and I have two backpacks. So I'm saying saying to myself, okay, you know, my dumb brain is like, do I just hold this in my lap the whole time because carry ons go up top, right? Not the backpack that you put under the seat. This is supposed to go under the seat. But there's only one seat. And I already have a backpack under that seat. Can I put this under another seat? I don't know. And so the guy, this guy, the flight attendant, he was, uh, you, I mean, they're all fake nice, I guess. But he was like, hey, my man, you're going to have to put that up in the locker under under that seat. And he points across the aisle. And there's no one sitting in those seats. But I was like, that still feels off. Like if no one's sitting there and you see a black backpack stashed under the seat, is that not going to set off alarms for everyone? <laughs> uh, and then I was like, oh, I, I, can't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit it in the overhead bin. In the bin? What? Bins are usually overfloweth, dude. So, you know, I open up the the bins. It's like there's nothing in there. I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> what? This is very odd. And then, of course, some people ended up sitting in the seats across the aisle. They had a little baby. And uh, I caught myself taking little sneak peeks at that baby. Do I have baby fever? Is it possible that I just, like, want another baby in my life? Huh. Any takers? No? Interesting. Yeah, so ended up putting in the bin. And, of course, her iPad was in, the, in that backpack. Not in the – why I put that iPad in my backpack – when it should have gone in her backpack and it would be easily accessible, I don't know. I don't think things through. Okay? Or I overthink things and then it comes back to bite me because I didn't I over I spent so much brain power on this thing that I didn't think about this thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then we proceeded to sit. So uh, the, the okay, so the weird thing about these seats, other than that, being so far away from the seat in front of us that I had to like every that I literally have to like unbuckle my seatbelt to get up to get the backpack underneath the seat or put it underneath the seat. And the flight attendant, uh, he you know, he he, ended, he finished it off after saying, hey, can you put your bag in the overhead bin or uh, underneath the seat uh, over there? He goes, uh, I appreciate you. And I was like, I've had a couple people say that to me. And I, I want to say, do you, though? Do you really appreciate me? Because not many people do. So... And then I was like, well, maybe he did mean it. You know what, Neil? Don't be so goddamn cynical all the time. Can you just accept that this guy actually cares about you and appreciates you as a customer and that he, he genuinely feels for you? And then I saw him talk to the next person, and then he ends it with, I appreciate you. And it's like, hey, my man, that can't be like your, 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 like your sign-off of every conversation, every interaction. That can't be your sign-off. Like, peace... Uh, 
I'm out. You know, those are typical, <laughs> maybe not so typical, but later. See ya until next time. Like they're appropriate sign offs for interactions and conversations. And I appreciate you has to be the most condescending of them all. You can't appreciate everyone, my man, is what I'm trying to say here. You can't appreciate everyone. There's a point, there's a part of you that probably does not appreciate me being an idiot, not knowing how to handle myself or my luggage, you know? So I don't appreciate, I appreciate you. How about that? Then we proceeded to sit on the, uh, on the plane with the door closed at the gate and then at the tarmac for an hour and 30 minutes. Uh, because of bad weather, not because of bad weather in Philadelphia. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> um, no, it's just bad weather on our route or course or whatever. And I'm I'm shocked that my daughter didn't have to go potty during that whole experience because they will not let you stand up. Even though they know they're going to be holding there for the next fucking hour and a half, they will not let you stand up and go to the bathroom. They throw a conniption fit if you get up just to go potty. So I was like super shocked and surprised and proud of my daughter that she didn't have to go potty. Of course, I am getting much better at knowing like any time, like timing it out and being like, okay, we're like about 10 minutes from getting on the plane. It's potty time. You don't have to go. You don't think you have to go, but you probably do have to go. And then if I, especially if I tell you, like, you're not going to be able to potty for the next hour. It's like, oh boy. Okay. Thanks for the heads up, dad. Uh, so yeah, she surprised she didn't have to go potty, but she, she was also, I, I don't know how, I don't know how I handled it. <laughs> I don't know how I handled it. I think she's able to play. Cause like, can we take out electronics while we're sitting there? I don't think so. Can we turn them on? I don't think so. I think it was that point where it's like, you know, they start rattling off the, all the 10,000 things that you can't do or that you have to do in order for them to just put a plane and on autopilot. <laughs> cool. So yeah, we eventually took off and then, um, it's that, that trip to South Carolina, I don't know what's going on. But it used to be two hours, a little over two hours. And it's starting to be like the when we flew back, the pilot got on and he was like, eh, flight time will be an hour and four minutes. I'm like, an what? An hour and four minutes? Is it because we're on a smaller plane? Does it go faster? I guess that makes sense. Like, are you speeding? What's happening? Are you breaking the law? Breaking the law? Breaking the law? So, yeah, we got down Saturday night. Had a nice dinner. Got to hang out in the pool area a little bit. That pool is becoming quite the hot spot. It's like my sister was apologizing to me uh, when I when we were leaving, and for you know after after being there a week, she apologized. She's like, oh, "I'm sorry, you know, we didn't do more or go to more places or blah blah blah." It's like your vacation. You should be blah 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 blah. And I'm just like, I don't think you really need to go. We don't need to go anywhere. Have you taken a look around at your friggin' house? It's a palace of pleasure. It's an estate of ecstasy. This place is like, you have everything you need here. Why the? Why would you go anywhere else? You know, it was. It was like, uh, and uh, you know, a, a friend, a mutual friend, or a friend of a friend, my sister's friends came over the day we were leaving and it was just like, this is place is like a resort. <laughs> it's like you got a nice pool. They they've added an outdoor TV to the mix, which I think I mentioned, you know, uh, over Thanksgiving, my brother-in-law's birthday, they introduced an outdoor TV to the mix. And it's like such a quality ad because it's to be able to be in the pool. I mean, every night was almost the same and I couldn't have asked for anything more. I did not get bored, not one bit. And I don't think the kids did either, which is, that's like, that's how you know stuff. It's good. That's good stuff. The kids are not getting bored, doing the same thing every night. I mean, it was literally rinse and repeat. It was, uh, you know, I had to work the whole week, which sucked, but it was like, get through work, throw on the bathing suit, get in the pool. Brother-in-law comes over with a, a nice cigar 
and a drink and it's like roll wheels out the outdoor tv and it's like i'm smoking a cigarette i'm drinking my drink watching a movie whilst swimming i don't know that you like what i don't that's it that's it that's that's it for me that's all i could do that from here to the end of time so cool of course the kids i don't know that they necessarily respect the cigar or or give any kind of care about me smoking a stogue but like so and i don't know if it's just because they know they'll get away with it with me because i'm a friggin beta i'm not even a beta dude i think i'm a gamma do gammas exist my brother-in-law is an alpha right he hunts big game animal he then collects their meat and grills it and it tastes amazing and then the rest of the body he stuffs throws it on the wall as if to say to people hey so that he can tell people hey i shot that killed it and then i ate it that and that and that and also that and i'm leaving space for that for that and i'm leaving space for this and that that so yeah he alphas so i think the kids know like all right we're not gonna we're not gonna we're not gonna fuck around with that guy we're gonna fuck around with this lame ass <laughs> this pushover soft as baby's bottom kind of loser so they're just like hanging all over me as i'm trying to smoke a, a cigar and i'm like i'm gonna like the dog uh, this dog is uh one years old one year old 12 months old uh and it and it grew it it was like the grinch's heart it grew three times <laughs> since the last time i saw him which was like april this dog is just like growing at the astronomical rate uh incredible like what probably the biggest dog that my family has ever owned you know they're just thinking it through like we had a couple golden retrievers uh, and a couple of portuguese water dogs and this is i think it's a golden doodle but it's black is that possible not to get racist but uh yeah this thing is big and fast whoa dude I mean, it kind of looks like a greyhound. And I, I was like, I mentioned that to my sister and my brother. And I'm like, you guys have got to think about racing this dog. I mean, I know, I know this, uh, this feels like the beginning of a Michael Vick situation, but there won't be fighting. They're racing. Totally different. So, so I got the dog almost knocking over my drink and almost stepping in my cigar ashes. And I have the, the two-year-old who... <laughs> Who's <laughs> also interested in jumping on me and, you know, coming close to the cigar ashes and the and the drink. So it was perilous to say the least, but I, I managed to make my way through it and no one got burnt and no one spilled my drink. Can't say the same for my brother-in-law. Uh, he was none too pleased with that. But I think the dog understands its place now. <laughs> it's like the dog's like, oh, so that's why the kids don't mess with you. Cool, 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 cool. Got it. Um, lots of hoagie bowls for lunch, lunchtime, which I, I dig. It's ba it's super simple. Just like a head of lettuce and a bunch of salami and ham and cheese and just chop it up, oil, vinegar, salt, pepper, if necessary, and just go to town. And it was just like, it, it was, I ate way too much of it, but it's like, it didn't feel like, you know, you eat too much of McDonald's pizza hut. Taco Bell, uh, it gets pretty dicey. I ate so much of this hoagie salad, Italian sub bowl, whatever you want to call it, no bread, every day, and it's like I, I think I could have I could have had that for dinner too. <laughs> I am a simple man. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't have very exquisite tastes. I'm pretty easy to please. Any takers? No. We ended up doing a leg workout on that Sunday. Uh, and I I used to not, when I worked out regularly, I know, I'll wait for the laughter to, to come down. Okay, you're still laughing. Just, can we just, can you go in the other room and laugh? Thank you. So when I did regularly work out, usually college, post-college, uh, I, I would skip leg workout day. And I think I'm not alone in that. I think a lot of people skip leg day thinking that it doesn't matter, but I actually uh, look forward to leg day. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, 
you know, no matter how long I've gone without lifting, I feel like I can, these legs, these tree trunks, they still got a little bit of strength in them. The rest of my body, I mean, it's useless. <laughs> it's just like I have no power or strength in anything from my waist up, head included. So I actually look forward. When he said leg walker, I was like, all right, let's do it. You know, I don't, I don't mind it because it's like I know at least I don't look completely weak. Like it feels like I'm lifting a lot, even though I'm not. And I feel I can get, I can, I never fail. There's not a lot of failing. Like with a lot of the other upper body stuff, I feel like I, I usually I'm failing at some point. Um, of course, the next week is a bitch. Like just walking, going up and down stairs, sitting down, standing up. Like that sucks, but it's a good suck. <laughs> I just feel like, you know, I, it's like I'll I'll put up with this because at least it's like a nice icebreaker conversation starter. Like, oh, are you okay? What happened? Like, ah, yeah. it's lifted legs, no big deal. My sister doesn't give herself enough credit and praise. She's like a great cook. Oh, I forgot to mention during the legs workout, and this was a good segue to my sister. Apparently, my brother-in-law posted on social media that he's he's uh, still can't believe he landed his trophy wife or a trophy wife. And so Haley was like, yeah, I don't think that's the right way to use that. And I don't think of myself as a trophy wife, <laughs> my sister. And I was just like, yeah, I don't think of my sister as a trophy wife either. Um, and then we got into like a debate about what is a trophy wife. You know, if you had to define it, what is it? And I don't know why my mind went there, but it was like, to me, a trophy wife is just, is not raising kids, right? It's not like a mom. Trophy wife is like, no kids. I'm just basically like, I, my sole purpose is to be arm candy for my husband. You know, like I'll work out and I'll wear really nice clothes and that's all I need. You know, just keep buying me things that look nice on me for you. I'll keep everything nice and in and fit and in shape and tight. And you can show me off and present me to people. Like, look at what I look at all the success I've had. This is evidence of all the success I've had. <laughs> and you point to your wife, trophy wife. You basically that's you know, you just hold it up like, see? See all the cool shit I've done? And then I get this now. I get a trophy wife because of that. So I don't see that. I don't see my sister as a trophy wife when she's li literally jugg juggling uh, three kids, two of which are boys, rowdy, rambunctious boys, a dog, a cat, chainsaws, uh, torches. So, you know, I don't see her as a trophy wife. Like, she's very good looking, you know? I don't, I like, I'm not ashamed to say that. So, I could see why he was like, oh, well, I, you know, I guess, you know, she ain't no troll. I'm like her brother, apparently. But she's, uh, she can, and she can cook now. She's never thought of herself as a good cook. And I'll, I mean, yeah, she, there was a while there where she just didn't cook. And it's like, it's fine. You'll find your way. We all do at some point. And uh, she just makes these amazing meals now. Like these Italian, I mean, they're not like anything, I guess, like uh, crazy complicated. And I actually appreciate that more. It's like, why spend all this, you know, and I'm sure this is why I'm I'm considered uh, trash. But why spend so much time, hour plus preparing a dinner that you eat for like 10 minutes, 5, 15 minutes? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, let's just simplify things. Let's throw some turkey burgers in the pot, pour marinara sauce over it with some uh, cheese and some broccoli. Call it a night. And that shit was tight. So I'm saying, you know, it doesn't have to be like crazy out of control for people to think that you're good or decent at it. She's also, uh, you know, because I had to work, was able to occupy my daughter for the whole week, which was extremely nice. Um, the neighbors did come over one night. The uh, the compound is not um remote anymore. I should say that 
there's a house in the, way in the back of the field, the soybean field. There's another house to the side of them. So it's like kind of not infringing on their territory, but is not what my brother-in-law had in mind. Like for the first, I don't know how many years, three, four years, it's like they were the only house and they could do whatever they want. You could literally just stroll and strut around buck naked, buck nude. No one cares. Now it's like, yeah, you might want to throw on like Speedo or something, a loincloth. Just throw a leaf, a big palm frond over that dong of yours, dude. Because we cannot be uh, gallivanting in Gallivant's Ferry all hoity-toity, raw, and fruity-tooty, fruity. So the neighbors, uh, one of the neighbors came over uh, with, with uh, the family. And they hung out. And we watched Avatar Way of Water in the pool. Uh, I I highly recommend, and maybe this is where James Cameron can continue to break ground, continue to revolutionize the uh, movie making, filmmaking industry. You know, he's already done so much with technology and the advancements there. There's two more Avatars coming out, which is wild to think about. But I think if anyone can do it, James Cameron can. Watching Avatar Way of Water in the pool was awesome. <laughs> I felt like I was in the movie, okay? And I'm thinking that that's an opportunity for James Cameron to go to movie theaters and say, um, okay, here's the deal. Here's how I see things happening. There's a lot of water in this movie. So um, we're going to submerge the theater uh, in water. And we can hand out, just you know, let people know this is going to be full of water and you, and they're going to be swimming and uh, we can have a screen above the water if they prefer above the water viewing, or we can have a below the water screen, below the surface screen for them to, wa to watch if they bring their goggles. You can provide the goggles, charge them a little extra or say they can bring their own from home. <laughs> I, and you know, I know I've already talked about avatar way of water and what I thought, but God damn, the, the, the scenes where they talk to the whales take me out of the movie every single time. It's like the movie, for the most part, is is good, is all right. And like I told my, I, I said this before, but like I don't know what happened where the visual effect effects, I don't know if it's like a, a trick that my brain plays on me or maybe that's just what happens to all brains after being exposed to visual effects for that long a time. They got better as the, <laughs> as the movie went on. But the talking to the whales is just, it's just, I can't, I can't suspend the disbelief. I really can't, you know, when she asks, when all the, to when all the, the friggin' whales come back to the, the one island and the prego, uh, it's not a Navi. Is it a Navi? It's like not the forest Navi. It's the sea Navi, the water Navi. Like when she goes and she's like, "How's your How's your son?" And the, and the whale's like, "Oh, he's doing okay." Like, <laughs> "How's your daughter?" It's like, "Get the get out of here." Um, I do want to know. Like they had that whole uh the scene where they kill one of the whales, <laughs> and Jermaine Clement is basically explaining to Spider like the the one uh kid of the colonel whatever who thinks he's a Navi but isn't he's totally human when Jermaine Clement, Clement is explaining why the whales are so cool to the spider it's like I feel like I wanted more you know it's like he basically was hyping them up and saying like emotional music math science like they're way more intelligent than we are and it's like I didn't really get that sense <laughs> that they're more intelligent. But now I want to know more and everything about them and why are we not seeing them all the time and why are they not, mm, they're so intelligent, why are they not taking care of the situation and outsmarting the, the opponent, the enemy? Anyway, I ate something called Gemsbach for the first time. Never heard of this thing in my life. G-E-M-S-B-O-K. Gemsbach. This thing kind of looks like a gazelle. 
uh, what is it? I mean, the people also ask, what is the difference between an Oryx and a Gem Gemsbach? I didn't know the Oryx was a thing. So it's uh, the Gemsbach or South African Oryx is a large antelope in the genus Oryx. It is native to the extremely dry, arid regions of Southern Africa, notably the Kalahari and the Nam Namib Namib Desert. Typically weigh around 490 to 660 pounds for the male, 220 to 460 pounds for the female, and they can run at a top speed of 37 miles per hour. Ooh, Jesus Christ. I just looked at a YouTube video that has a preview, a, a thumbnail where the Gemsbach is just stabbed the hell out of a lion's booty. Isn't that fantastic? So yeah, apparently I ate this thing. My brother-in-law killed it at some point. I don't know when. I don't know where. But uh, he smoked it. I had it. Well, it was getting to the point where I was I was starting to chew my own face off. You know what that happened? Like, the neighbors came over, and everyone's chit-chatting. And before you know it, it's like, uh, the sun has gone down, okay? And, you know, the sun goes down in July around 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern. So <laughs> I was like... And it was an hour, almost an hour after that. And I was like, I am, I'm losing my mind. Like, are we, did I miss dinner? Did we have dinner and I blacked out? What happened? Did I smoke too much of my cigar? And like, am I, am I hallucinating? Am I delusional? Is it not, is it just getting darker earlier? Did I not catch that change? And uh, I was just like, I need, I need to eat. So I went inside and, and <laughs> served myself some gems back, which was good. Uh, my my aunt described it fairly accurately, and I'm gonna borrow it. Like beef jerky, but not dry. So if you had like nice, plump, juicy beef jerky, <laughs> that's what it tasted like, and it was oh so good. Uh, my mom refuses to eat that kind of stuff. She refuses to eat anything that my brother in law kills. Um, <laughs> it's 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 a funny little rivalry they have going on. <laughs> So yeah, I can't recommend Gemsbach enough if you can get your hands on it. Um, and got to play Mario Kart? Hello. I have not played video games in a long ass time. Uh, I, I honestly can't remember the last time I played a console video game. Like I played um, Retro Bowl. I think that's what it's called, Retro Bowl. The, the Tecmo Bowl kind of, I don't want to say knockoff, but influenced by Tecmo Bowl. But I play that on my iPhone, iPad, and even that I I had to I had to I had to I had to quit cold turkey. It was just getting out of hand, and I was just like, "What am I doing? This I have ten Super Bowl rings. Ten. Am I going for twenty? What else can I do in this game? Why am I doing this? Why am I playing this still?" So I had to do that, quit that cold turkey. But then I get my hands on a goddamn controller again, console. You know, she has a Nintendo Switch, which I didn't know that you it. Uh, like I guess I should have guessed, but Nintendo Switches are the balls, dude, the bomb. Like that you can access different versions of Mario Kart across different consoles. Like here's Nintendo, here's Super Nintendo, here's N64. Like, oh, okay, cool. So we played Mario Kart, and uh, I guess Mario Kart has done changed <laughs> since I played it like 20 some odd years ago, 30 some odd years ago. But, uh, we were playing these, playing, like, I like how, uh, like, there's maybe a sentence explanation of what the control, how to controller, how to control and what's going on before the game has started. And I'm just like, oh, okay, like, I'm just going to press a bunch of buttons and hopefully figure it out. And I'm like, how do I shoot? How do I shoot my shell? I have, like, I assume I have shells. How do I shoot my shell? And it's just like, no, you just have to run away from the other team so they don't eat you and, and put you in prison. And I was just like whoa okay i feel like uh maybe i played a different version of mario kart because <laughs> like i don't know my uh but i it's got me thinking now that maybe i should try and purchase uh, uh some kind of game cons console i don't know if it's going to be nintendo switch but it might have to be just a console that and i almost googled like best video game console for four-year-olds <laughs> I almost did that, and I was like, I think Google's going to be like, no, dude, no, too young. You're you're a maniac. But I, I think I started playing video games pretty early. 
you know, my mom says that I was in diapers when I was playing video games and had to spank me on the reg because I refused to come to dinner because of the video games. And I've adjusted very well. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a sarcasm laying on pretty thick. So, but I am tempted to, to do this um, because I think that would be a nice little bonding experience. But also I'm using the bonding experience excuse because I want to start playing video games again. <laughs> <laughs> and there you have it midlife crisis Beep, boop, 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 boop. uh watched a bunch of movies while we were down there um but before i get to that the pool getting back to the pool my uh my daughter can't really swim at least she couldn't before this week down in south carolina which is uh, tough because she's been going on these field trips and one of the field trips every single week is this, to this aquatic center, quote unquote, a pool, indoor pool. And I, and I just see like, they send me pictures and videos and it's just like the, t the swimming instructor just like dragging her around the pool. <laughs> you know, she's not really doing much swimming on her own. So basically this whole week, it was just like, all right, I guess this is like an unofficial mission that I'm going to try and get her to swim or at least be better than what she, you know, cause I think there's, it's just fear at first, right? It's just fear of like, you know, I'm going to drown. I can't stay afloat and I'm going to panic and the panic will cause me to sink even more faster. So, um, and I gotta say, started off kind of rough, but by the end of the week, she was like asking me repeatedly, you know, um, daddy can i swim from here to there and i was kept challenger challenging her too where it's like i'd be like maybe a foot two feet away from her and she, and i'd be slowly backing up and she'd be like no no please don't go further any back any further back please stay stay right there and i'm just like oh man like i need to challenge her so every time she would start swimming i'd start like slowly going back and i'm like i'm not gonna, obviously i'm not gonna let you drown i'm not gonna let you sink not yet but um, I feel like that was pretty effective because by the end of like the last day or two, she's trying to, she's swimming almost basically half the pool or at least the width of the pool, you know, from where the deep end kind of starts to the ladder in the deep end, you know, so, um, just now starting to realize that, you know, when you're wearing goggles, you can put your head under the water when you swim, that kind of thing. And she still hasn't gotten down the idea of like, please just blow bubbles out when your head's below the water. Meanwhile, my friggin' two-year-old cousin, like, uh, not cousin, nephew, who, I mean, turned two like a couple months ago, is freestyling in the pool. He's wearing floaties, yes, but he is like doing freestyle swimming, literally. like freestyle stroke and putting his head down the water and blowing bubbles as he's doing the freestyle. And I was like, I turned to my sister. I was like this, he's a swimmer. And I think you know what to do. Phelps his ass. Although I, I do not see him being like, I cannot foresee foretell that, uh, he would be, a uh, an elite swimmer. Cause I don't think he has a swimmer's body. And it's funny because like my grandfather, huge was like a Hall of Fame swimming coach in Rhode Island, and you'd be like, "This dude, the five foot six leprechaun." Okay, but yeah, he was the swimming coach, a very good swimming coach, and my dad was a great swimmer. Um, and I know there there is a photo of my dad on a surfboard where he does look like he has a swimmer's body, but ultimately, like, not lean, mean kind of machine you know and uh, i was uh, pff, i know it doesn't look like it right now if you're watching but i was a good swimmer as well i just you know i'm a little on the husky side and i don't know I, it would be nice to see a fat guy win a win an event just once <laughs> or a husky guy but uh that's just not how water dynamics work aqua dynamics is that what you say so uh, my my nephew is a similar build where he's like, I look at his feet and I'm like, this guy is going to be a goddamn sumo wrestler. Like he's just going to be thick. He's going to be, a, I mean, he's already a unit for sure. 
So uh, hopefully they just keep pumping the him the, with the protein, and he just like he becomes like he's the number one draft pick, you know, a left tackle for the New York Football Giants. Uh, yeah. So it was a great week, a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, I wish I could have stayed longer. You know, it feels like they were they were having. I had to leave in the middle of another pool party, and I was like, oh, so sad. Um, my aunt and uncle came in their RV camper, which I think that's something that that's like on my bucket list that I'm never going to get. You know, it's just like, I'm looking around at this like beautiful house, the pool and like the RV camper. And I'm like, <laughs> never going to get it. 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 Woo, 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 woo. Um, yeah. So but I had a great time. <laughs> it's just, I mean, even their couch, they have a love sack couch and it's just like, Oh, you can, you can nap on this. You can just lay down. It's so comfy. Ugh, just everything's so nice. So great. So my daughter is a tattletale though. There's no doubt about it. She's a tattletale. And I, I have a little bit of tattletale in me. I'm not proud of it, but not to the extent that she has like the, the tattletaling is out of control it's just like every five seconds just like you know aunt Haley, so and so did this so and so did that so and so did this and um it's uh it's tough because it's like you want to raise a tough lady tough woman who can you know you hope that the woman is tough because it's it's uh ugh, it's ugly out there it's mean so it's like hopefully she gets thick skin I don't know how to thicken it up, but let's get that skin thickened because a lot of it, she gets uh, pre pretty emotional sometimes over the littlest things. And like, like the immediacy with which tears come out is admirable. I'll say that. The fact that it's like something goes wrong, it's just instant and like tears are shooting out. And like, and I'm just like, oh my, oh my God. Okay. I need to process this. <laughs> what? So we got to work on that for sure. But, um, I had fun reading to the kids too. I read book, I read a book to them basically every night when they went to bed and, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was fun. I enjoyed that. Oh, we also watched the, the, I guess it's the middle trilogy, but it's really the first trilogy of Star Wars. Whereas uh, episode four, five, six, New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. Uh, I feel like, and it's probably, I know I'm biased and partial to it because those are the first ones that I was exposed to, but what the hell happened with that trilogy, <laughs> with that franchise? It's just like, this trilogy still friggin' holds up. And I don't even know why Lucas thought it was necessary to like insert all that CGI cutscene bullshit. It's like for the, I guess it was for the Phantom Menace re-release. Maybe they did it in 97 or 98. I don't know. I think I was in high school or college. And it was like these just completely arbitrary, unnecessary special like CGI scenes that they, they, they have the, I guess they have the capability to do. Does it look good? No, but let's just shove it in there anyway. It's like really throws things off. Um, But yeah, and it was great watching it with, I'll say my niece because my niece is 10 where my nephew and my daughter, I just, they, they just like kind of tune in tune out. They're like, they don't get it or they're scared. The kid, the, the kids of that age, or at least my daughter, she will, she will literally do anything else except watch the movie when she's scared. And I'd be like, well, watch the movie. And then eventually you find out, Oh no, you're scared. Oh, that's why you're pestering me to do this thing. That's like a little out of your wheelhouse. Interesting. And then, uh, so after we came home, uh, I dropped her off at her mom's place and then, uh, I came home and, and watched a, a pretty decent movie that I hope to talk about in a little bit. And then, uh, Sunday was, was a degen day. It was a D day, degenerate day where it's like, I'm going to sleep in as long as I can. I'm going to eat. I'm going to just veg the F out on the couch Although I did go to the driving range and uh, uh, your boy is getting pretty good. No, sorry. Your boy is getting better. <laughs> I feel like I do have a golf event coming up in about a month. Yeah. A month from this date. 
and uh it's like at least i'm hitting the majority of the ball straight you know i looked over and there was like a legit eight-year-old like hitting it as far as i i'm hitting it let's not think too much about that let's just focus on your stroke and getting that ball straight <laughs> let's not focus on the fact that a boy whose nuts have not dropped yet is uh <laughs> Got a better stroke than you, yikes! So uh, yeah, like I said, I did watch get to watch a bunch of movies and TV over the past week. So I thought I'd catch you up on a lot of that shit. While I was down in South Carolina, I got to watch The Outlaws on Netflix. You know, I'm a big fan of the Workaholics. I'm a big fan of This Is Important, which is the uh, the podcast with the Workaholics guys, Adam Devine, uh, Anders Holm, and Blake Anderson, and also Kyle Newlichek. So, and they had been taught, you know, Adam had been promoting it on the podcast and I was like, all right, I got to do my boy a solid. It's not going to cost me anything extra. So, uh, I think this might be a nice little, you know, I'm not expecting, you know, Oscar worthy type shit, you know, uh, I'm expecting laughs and that's all I want is laughs. It can be dumb. I, I let's get dumb. Let's laugh and let's get dumb. And my sister was on board. So. We ended up watching The Outlaws on Netflix. Um, and who else is in it? Pierce Brosnan, Ellen Barkin, Nina Dobrev. Nina Dobrev, dude. Nina Dobrev. I don't think I've watched enough stuff with her in it, and I need to change that. A lot of the stuff, uh, I feel like it's just not up my alley, though. What else has she been in? Like Vampire Girls or whatever? She's a Canadian actress. Oh, really? Don't you know? That's not Canadian. I don't know why I said that. Uh, so, Outlaws. Uh-huh, lucky day, fam. When this town became you, dog days, and a crash path, plant letters, the vampire diaries. Yeah, I mean, oh, Triple X, Return of Xander Cage. I don't remember that. The Final Girls. That was good. I forgot she was in that. Let's Be Cops, also underrated. Perks of being a wallflower. Mm. Yeah, all right, yeah. But, yeah. I just, I could, yeah, highly recommend Nina Dobrev. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so Nina Dobrev plays, so Adam Devine plays a banker who uh, plays it by the books, very safe, very timid, which is very atypical of Adam Devine. And he's engaged to Nina Dobrev's character. They're planning out the wedding, uh, and Nina, Nina Dobrev's character, uh, I'll just say Nina says her parents are going to be attending, which is much to the surprise of Adam Devine. And uh, he's like, whoa, really? I thought that you haven't seen them in years. And she's like, yeah, they're coming in. They're, they want to come, blah, blah, blah. So they arrive and it's Pierce Brosnan and Ellen Barkin, which is, uh, I mean, you couldn't have done, done much better with the casting on that. And uh, I think Lil Rel works at the bank where Adam Devine works. And there was another lady, I can't remember her name, who works there. And, uh, you know, it, essentially, you you come to find out that the, the parents, the in-laws, the future in-laws are outlaws. And uh, they specifically rob banks. So they have targeted. And so that's, for most of the movie, I was just questioning of whether or not if Nina Dobrev was in on the whole thing. And it was like, she was part of the long con. Like, I'm going to seduce this guy. I'm going to fall in love with him. He's going to propose to me. We're going to plan a wedding. Also, my parents can rob this bank. Like, that was going through my mind for a long portion of the movie. Um, so they end up robbing the bank. Pretty decent robbery scene, that first one. Um, but you can't, you, you know, you don't, I guess, actually know it's them. But the little mannerisms, the little quirks, eccentricities, idiosyncrasies of uh, Pierce Brosnan, Adam Devine picks up on. And it's like, yeah, it's probably them. And so he eventually goes to Nina Dobrev. And this scene kind of bothered me, but it was like, I get it. What else are you going to do? Where he tells her and reveals like, hey, I think your parents rob banks. They're bank robbers. She starts off that conversation with... I know something's bothering you. You're obviously affected by something, so I need you to spill it. I need you to come come clean, come forward. Uh, you, you know you can tell me anything. I won't get upset. And then he says, 
you think your parents are bank robbers? And she immediately gets upset. And I was just like, ah. And I think that that was intentional to play for laughs, but I was like, I'm not laughing, bro. That's a little too real. <laughs> it's a little too real. You need to talk more. And then I talk more, and it's like, you shouldn't have said that. Like, oh, this is why I don't talk. So, Adam Devine, great as always. Uh, I'd say the first quarter of the movie, lots of laughs. First half, decent amount of laughs. And then it starts to get serious towards the, in the beginning of the second half, towards the end. Uh, Lauren Lapkus plays like the rival bank manager. She is from uh, the wrong Missy, which, uh, <laughs> it, but, yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty outlandish performance, but it got my attention. I was like, all right, you know what? I don't see many women doing what you're doing, so bravo. I like it. I want some more of it. And so she gives a little more of that energy in this movie as the rival bank manager. <laughs> I mean, she's only, I think, just the one scene at the end, but pretty cool. Uh, the 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 one of the robbery scenes, I think it just like a lot of it was just uh, logistics for me. <laughs> like like the second bank robbery where it just it was hard to keep like. I think my logistics structure brain movie structure brain kicked in at some point and i was like this doesn't like this is so far-fetched at this point that i just can't this is just too out there like for instance there they i I assume they live in like a, a, a pretty quaint suburban area that's actually might be pretty affluent or near an affluent area and like they there's like a full on so the the bank robbery where well first of all adam devine is uh Nina Dobrev is kidnapped, right? And Adam Devine is, uh, suddenly flips the script, flips the switch, and is like, uh, I'm going to help you guys rob a bank so that we can get my wife back. And so that's when the parents start to... to Because initially they think, oh, this guy is such a pussy. Like, he's he's just, like, such an idiot. Like, we can't believe our daughter's marrying this guy. And then when he's, like... I'll do anything to get her back. I'll rob. I'll help you rob a bank. I know banks. I'm a bank manager. Blah blah. So that's when that's when they start to come around. So I thought his his is the quickness with which he like decided like oh I'm gonna I'm gonna rob banks now and and the fact that he was so gung ho and so far in it's like yes that I guess that is a sign of his like dedication to his fiance Nina Dobrev. But at the same time, I was like. So he's just all in. Like he doesn't care about shooting guns or like there's no hesitancy. It doesn't seem like there's any hesitancy really. I don't know. Overthinking it as always. Um, but that scene where he dresses up like Shrek and they try to rob, rob that one bank that's like run by the really poor, like the really awful bank manager that doesn't care or pay attention. is like playing VR games the whole time. Um, he dresses up like Shrek and then there's like a just a full on, like he just gets manhandled by he says the guy that looks like the rocks character in Moana, like Maui, which I thought was spot on. But like he's just getting his ass kicked. Nothing else is happening in the bank. Like people are just watching him getting his ass kicked. And then outside, Ellen Barkin and uh, Pierce Brosnan are just having a full on gunfight with these two armored truck drivers. And like there's like for an extended period of time. And I'm like, is anyone else around? What's happening? Like, is it really that sleepy a town that the, that people are just completely asleep to this like full blown gunfight. And then of course, like him, I guess taking the, amb- uh, the armored truck and driving it through the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had very mixed feelings about that. I was just like, Oh, I don't know what to think about this. <laughs> like, uh, it's like I've never seen it before. So there's that. That's pretty cool. But this, yeah. So, um, ultimately, I came around on it. It was like one of those Family Guy jokes where it goes on and on, and it's just like, eventually, you're like, all right, okay, this is pretty funny. That's how that's how uh, that scene played out. But um, I thought it was interesting that like I don't know that anyone's gonna watch this movie, but. I'll spoil it for you, right? Spoiler alert, I guess. So he, like, Adam Devine doesn't get in trouble at all. 
like Pierce Brosnan and Ellen Barkin, they got they get arrested and rung up. But then how did Adam Devine es- like evade? First of all, how did he get back in the bank vault so quickly? I don't know. The fact that he was able to like he gets uh, spooked and he shoots he shoots like two of the the thugs at the end. Um, by the way, Nina Dobrev in that <laughs> makeup and the wedding gown, very funny. Um, the minute the minute when Adam Devine is at the house of the the crime boss's house and all those mini- miniature <laughs> Doberman pinchers are chasing him, so funny. Michael Rooker is in this, who uh, played what's his face in Guardians of the Galaxy, with the he whistles and the arrow goes around. That dude. Michael Rooker's in this. So it's like they got some decent people. And, and like the scene, I, I was expecting, fully on expecting uh, Dan Marino show up. They had all that talk about, uh, all that talk about, the I mean, the scene, this the lunch, day drinking lunch scene with the two parents, two sets of parents. By the way, the two parents for Adam Devine's character, like very nice selection. I think it's Julie Haggerty. From airplane and uh the other guy who uh, richard kind no that's not it he he would voice the whale in uh the flummels movie which adam divine was also in he talks like is very i can't do it but he talks very loud and uh <laughs> i enjoyed most of the scenes that those parents were in but so the they are portrayed as like these conservative buttoned up type people. And then um, something about, they ask about how the parents met. And it, he, she said, well, I was just coming from an orgy. And they're, everyone's like, what? And she's like, oh, I don't know if I'm saying it right. It's, it's, I might be confusing you. I don't know if that's what it's called. It's where a bunch of like random people come together and fuck. <laughs> it's like, she's just this nice you know earlier in the conversations talk about how like uh, day drinking day drinking is for satanists or whatever like just so buttoned up and then talking about an orgy and she said that dan marino was there and like the father was waiting in the car and so adam devine's character thinks that he might be (laughs) the offspring of dan marino i was like if dan marino doesn't make a cameo in this movie wow major whiff like how good would that payoff be at the end to have him come in? Uh, but no, alas, no dice. But like Adam Devine's character shooting the two thugs, like I, th- I thought that would be a bigger moment reaction. Like I, he got spooked and like ended up shooting them accidentally. But it was like that would still, even as bad as those thugs are, like if you're like the character that you're supposed to be, who's like gets giddy whenever his tushy is touched. <laughs> You'd think like, hmm, there'd be a little more of a, a interesting reaction there. Do I recommend it? Yeah, I guess so. You know, it's got some laughs, you know, it's not like you have to go to the theater. It's not like you have to rent it. And if you have Netflix, so I say throw it on. I think he said 20 million people watched it. In the first week, but I don't know if it's I don't is it twenty million or is it twenty million minutes watched? I don't know. I think it might have been twenty million. So yeah, I mean there were some things that I would have liked to have seen gone differently. Like I think it was a decent premise. It's a nice, simple, easy premise to understand. Clever title. Um, you know they kind of made it out so that the parents aren't all bad and that they're doing this because they want to be free of the debt to the crime boss and you know. So, uh, it's not, it's, I mean, I, I think they could have gone some different ways with it. That's all. But I can't get enough of those. I think Adam Devine has found a nice little sweet spot with these like rom-com comedy type things on Netflix. You know, they always talk about on this is important about nineties comedies, like where have they gone? You know, why don't we do them anymore? And, and, uh, this felt like kind of a nineties type of comedy. Um, you know, I think I, I was, 
there were a couple of setups that I thought would have been nice to have payoffs, you know? Um, like they open on him building a to model scale with all his figures, action figures and toys of like the wedding table assignments, which I thought was, was cool. The little, like the slow movement through all the different action figures and toys. Like, Oh, look at that. Oh, look. Oh. It was like nostalgia on blast. Um, so I was thinking that might come back to have a payoff at the end. Like they might end with that somehow, but. There are a lot of setups where it's just like like touching the t touching his tush. Like, why did they bring that up? And then it happens when Lauren Lapkus is showing him how to like open the vault because she has this impenetrable vault, and he's like, "Oh, I'm so jealous. I just want to know. I have to know. You know, you bested me, you beat me, but I have to know how like you how do you do it." And so she ends up showing him and showing off in the process, and she slaps the button. Is like a little ooh. Unless I missed something, I was just like, wait, that what, was that the payoff? Like, why? What's with the butt thing? What's going on there? So, yeah, fucking watch it, dude. Like, it's not... I think it it pretty much holds your attention for most of the movie, I think. Um, we also watched 65. So I, I was very tempted when I saw the trailer for this thing. I was like, yes. I got very, most excited, most hype. So pumped that to know that this was coming down the pike. Uh, described as uh, I I had never played it, but Turok, Dino Hunter, I think that's what it's called. Turok game, series of first person shooter video games based on the comic book character of the same name, set in a primitive world inhabited by dinosaurs and other creatures. Yeah, so it's kind of like Turok um, meets Jurassic Park, sort of. And it's PG-13. It's it's a quick movie, hour and 33 minutes. Some would say maybe too quick. Even so, with that runtime, it's like the choices that they made in terms of, well, you, you there was so much, like my brother-in-law said it, like that went by fast. It almost went by a little too fast. But then it had these moments where it was like too slow. It's like, why did we focus on these very slow sequences or moments when there's so much more to explore. Um, so I think that's what ultimately was its undoing. And I don't know. I I, I don't... I, Adam Driver, you would think he has the chops to kind of carry an action movie and even be possibly even be an action movie star. I mean, the dude used to be a Marine. So like, and he knows how to handle weaponry and he's a big-ish dude, right? I think he's, I don't know how big he is, but he seems like he's a big, tall dude, imposing. He's got the face. Like, he's got all the tools that you would think you would need to be that, that kind of action star. And uh, they kind of went the After Earth route, which did not, I was, you know, I mean, it's it's After Earth meets Jurassic Park, essentially, you know. In After Earth, Will Smith crash lands with his son. They have to, you know, get through this wild terrain, um, and you know they find out it's Earth. So I feel like they took that concept and then they're like, and let's just add dinosaurs. Um, so if you're not familiar, it's it's an, an astronaut crash lands on a mysterious planet, only to discover he's not alone. Um, and the tagline is 65 million years ago, prehistoric earth had a visitor, which they also put text on screen in the movie in case you missed that tagline. And in case you were wondering what the 65 was in the title, they made it very blatantly clear. Like what I was confused by is like, there was that one of the openings, I think it was the opening scene where they have the text on screen. It says before the advent of humankind, for the advent of mankind or something like that. Uh, but something explored the heavens. And it was just like, so are these not humans? What's going on here? Because they look like humans. Like Adam Driver looks like a human. But he comes from a planet called Samaris or something like that. Um, where they have uh, pretty cool waves. Pretty cool bitch. Um, and advanced technology. But I remember watching this trailer and I was got I just got so friggin' psyched. And I think that uh 
if it had it did not have a, a big budget it had a budget of like six uh i don't even think it was 60 million dollars i think that's how much it made at the box office but i think the budget was like more like 30 35 million dollars and i would imagine given that it's really only three actors with speaking lines four actors with speaking lines it's like adam driver's a dad he's got the, his daughter the mother and then the kid he he finds on the spaceship that crashes that he was piloting. So I think a lot of money went to making sure the dinosaurs look good. And they did for the most part. Like I, I watched an episode of Prehistoric Planet last night. And I think that Prehistoric Planet, the, 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 the special effects, the visual effects, the graphics on that are like top notch. And I, I'm wondering why. And I'm, I think I know the reason or the answer why why the movies can't seem to get that down. Like how's whatever prehistoric planets got going on, whatever secret they got underneath their sleeve, like share it with the world so we can have, you know, better looking dinos on screen. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, overall, it just felt like they really, it was more of a, just a father daughter story. I mean, it's a survival story, right? Like it's, it's based in survival. Um, but uh, there, in terms of action, like I think you know, people and uh, people were craving more action and thought it would be, it would just be him just going around, just like shooting dinosaurs left and right, and, and just nonstop, you know. But it was a lot of quiet moments, a lot of slow moments, you know. He has a daughter, and he's taking, he's going on this two-year mission to take this passenger ship to wherever um, ends up get, running into an unexpected asteroid meteor meteor field, which uh, damages the plane and causes it to crash on this planet, which turns out to be earth 65 million years ago. Whoa. How's your mind blown? Cool. And uh, you come to find out, I guess the about halfway through the movie, it's usually when the like the, the twist happens or one of the twists, something unexpected. You know, he all the passengers on the ship died except for this one one girl, which before he discovers the girl, like it it is crazy how quick he goes from uh he does he like doesn't even give the thought of trying to survive on this planet like any chance. <laughs> it was just like he went from recording a message, right? He records the message basically detailing like no survivors, uh, location unknown, you know, I guess don't send help. And then he re-records it. And I think it's a little more straightforward and professional, not as bleak. And then the next scene, he's like about to blow his head off. It's just like, wait, what? what? We are, we're already committing suit. We're already killing ourselves. We're already giving up. We're already giving up. Cool. Like that felt a little <laughs> like, whoa, bo, 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 bo. Hey, we're, uh, pump the brakes, homie. It's not all bad. And so then he eventually discovers this girl who doesn't speak English. English isn't her fir first language, but she's around the same age or maybe younger than her, his daughter. And so the, the girl takes interest in him and the daughter and keeps playing all these, uh, I guess what you call video tapes, cassettes, whatever kind of technology that was. They look like um like miniature floppy disks or hard disks. And they would play either holograms or videos. And that's when um you find out that the daughter died. And it's like the big <gasps> moment. So I guess him just immediately turning to suicide is like a little more believable knowing that his daughter died. Or like, did he know the daughter had died at that point? I don't know. It's like, you still have a wife. Unless, the, what happened there? So I think that, like, they, there's so much more that they could have played with or done with the characters. And, um, yeah, I don't know. And I think that it's a, it's like a byproduct or side effect of not having enough budget. Because I think if you give this if you're saying like Adam Driver just takes on dinosaurs um, for two hours and you just have more obstacles, more challenges, more setbacks. 
maybe this maybe this is uh you know i think people are are more apt to like it instead it's like you get some interesting interactions between the two um you know it, he basically uses a tactic that he uses with his daughter to help the the girl like get in her good graces with the blowing and the the hands to make the whistle, which I've never been able to do. Nope, oh, can't do it. Of course, she does. The, she does the other kind of whistle where it's like the the pinkies. Eh, like I can't do that either. Um, but I know the people who can do that do it a lot. <laughs> it's like I'm gonna do that every single opportunity I can get. I thought the creatures look good. The dinosaurs look good. I think they look better on prehistoric planet, but I was looking, I was specifically looking for like flaws or like this is just the flash level CGI. And I thought it passed the test for the most part. I thought they did a pretty decent job, especially at the at the very end with the geyser and the T-Rex. I thought that was uh, pretty cool. So as they're trying to make their way to the escape shuttle um, where... You know, Adam Driver says the kid's parents are when he knows damn well they did. They did. They did. They uh, also, he also finds out that there's like a, there's a fate, a fatalistic imminent collision impending with the humongous asteroid that basically wipes out the dinosaurs. What I'm, what I'm interested about with the asteroid is I know it's big and I think I remember someone saying that it's it is the size of Texas, basically, and that's big. To take out all life on Earth, though, and all the dinosaurs, is it because the radiation from it just basically pollutes the entire Earth? All right, I guess I buy that. But if you don't have that aspect of it, and it's just like it just hits the Earth, how does that cause? Like in my head, I'm thinking, okay, tidal waves, earthquakes, like it's going to disrupt some shit, but like kill all life, life killer at that size in this economy. So that, that was kind of threw me off, but I guess, uh, I need to, I need to bone up on my history, bro. Pun intended. Um, you know, I did, I dug, I dug that final scene. I did like that where they're, they're basically like it, they're teasing you saying like, they're so close to escaping and getting in this, in this shuttle. And then they get hit by an asteroid. They fall off unconscious. And then of course the T-Rex makes a, a nice reappearance or the, like there's two T-Rexes. I think it's like, you, you gotta, you gotta have a feeling that that's going to be the final opponent, final boss. Um, and to have her, I think she saved his life a couple times. Remember she saves his life in the quicksand with the tree Oh, the scene where she's running away from the mini raptor or whatever, and he had given her like a a little baggie of grenades. The grenades are like this little, smaller than golf balls, I'd say. But for her to capture the t- the little mini raptor in that log, which was like very smart, very genius, but then to dump all the grenades in there, it's like yeah, I get it. You want to make sure he's dead, but let's like go one by one. Let's just test one first. She dumped all the grenades in there. Me and my brother-in-law were like, oh my God, I can't believe she just did that. But yet again, she's like eight or nine. What do you what do you expect? Oh, a fossilosicus? Fossilosicus. Because they kept calling it a T-Rex. And I'm like, that's not a T-Rex. This T-Rex had long ass arms, dude. And it was, it was basically like running around on all fours. So I was like, Okay, we're 65 million years ago, but yet, like, this is, they have the gen- genetically modified dinosaurs that you would see in Jurassic World? What? It's like, no, no, no. That's an actual dinosaur, and it's not a T Rex. A fossil, a fossilosuchus. That's where the geyser. I didn't, and fun fact, I didn't know geysers were that hot. Shit, dude. The geyser t- tore the friggin' skin off that, uh, off that damn fossilosuchus. So, um, oh God, the scene where they're camping out for the night and he sets up like those, almost like those things that look like flares to, that basically are sensors that can sense the proximity of someone coming towards them or whatever. 
but there there's the part where she's like foaming at the mouth and you're like whoa what did she get bit by a rabid dino or something that we didn't know about and he's like immediately goes into action mode to try and save her and you know the initial thought that we both had was like oh she ate the poison berries that she picked like even after the even after he told her like do not eat this does not go into your stomach uh not good like she went ahead and ate the goddamn poison berries it's like no he opens up her mouth and there's some kind of ugh nasty bug inside and i don't know why i thought this but like i was like oh snap so he's going to lure out the bug with either food or fire i feel like to maybe i don't know i think i would think that fire they would shoo away from it but sometimes i don't know the drawn to the heat or the light i don't know no he, he uses a razor blade and just like dangles it over the bug and the bug comes up for it and then that's when he kills it i was like oh what like bugs are into cutlery news to me dude and then geysers being that hot i i would not have thought that thank god i never went to yosemite because <laughs> i would have been like i would have been like you know those uh the dancing magical water fountains at, at epcot center or disney world where it's like it kind of just whoop bloop, bloop, it shoots streams from there to there and you like as a kid you just stand in it and you stand on it and you're like hey, i'm blocking it <laughs> I would have done that with the geyser and I would have clean lost half my face along with my body. So, and my soul. Decent movie, but it's like the premise, ugh. Not well received by critics, I'll say that. And I think the audiences were more forgiving. Um, It's crazy to think that Adam Driver, I think he got his start on Girls, the HBO uh, series. He's a former Marine. This is the first time in an Adam Driver's film career where he utilizes his weapons training from his old career. I don't know if that's true or false. It doesn't seem like it's true, but I guess, yeah, because you're thinking about Kylo Ren, lightsabers, like he wasn't trained on lightsabers, I don't think. So uh, I hope that this is a nice stepping stone for Adam Driver to be an action star I think the only thing holding him back is that there were a lot of things in this movie that didn't scream action star. He definitely brought, and I think that's a product of, okay, he's a dad. And so he had this girl, his dadness kicks in. And so that's part of why um, there are moments where it's like, I don't see him as an action star. Um, But maybe this is like the new kind of action star. I don't know. I just think he could be an action star, but he just didn't pull it off in this movie. But I can see it. It's right there. Um, 35% of critics gave it a favorable review, a positive review with an average rating of 44.8 out of 10. Yeah, how's was that? So the consensus is sodden sci-fi that somehow finds a way to bungle Adam Driver fighting dinosaurs. 65 is closer to zero. Boom, roasted, dude. Metacritic, which uses a weighted average, assigned the film a score of 40 out of 100. So it's, yeah, 40 of 100, 4 out of 10, 5 out of 10, based on 27 critics indicating mixed or average reviews. Audiences served by cinema score gave the film an average grade of C plus on an A plus to F scale. And post track gave it an overall fifty four percent positive score, with thirty cent for saying they would recommend the film. But I, I mean, I don't know. I would not recommend the film. I just think they could have done it a whole lot better. And it's like it was the recipe for success was there. It was there. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe I would have liked to see more of the technology, but they did. They did. They didn't flaunt it, but they did showcase the technology a fair amount. And maybe this is a case of like, if it were successful, they could, they could um, reveal a lot more stuff in the sequel sequels because they left a lot on the table in this movie where it's like, wait, why do y'all exist? What is planet Samaras? What? Like, there's a lot of questions about that went completely unanswered in the movie. Like, 
humans exist are you humans are you just are you just look like humans how did the planet samaris come to be there's not a lot of details around that and like um i was fully expecting like them to do some clever thing at the end where it's like they escape but they left something behind that didn't get destroyed by the the dinos that by the asteroid and so somehow that leads to mankind happening on earth like mankind wouldn't have ha- basically i i was thought okay mankind is not going to happen if it weren't for this visitor who's a human so it's like humans wouldn't have happened if this visitor hadn't come i thought that was where it was going and it, I, I don't not it doesn't seem that way <laughs> I just thought there would be a clever little aha at the end. Like, oh, so this is why we have mankind. Adam Driver's astronaut ace. So, I don't know. I'd recommend the film. You got nothing else going on. I I wish there were a little bit more dinosaurs. Um, You know, I think that my brother-in-law was like, where are the frigging creatures? Where are the dinosaurs? And I think that's okay. it's, It's like that, the Jaws approach where it's like we're not going to show the the big bad creature um we're going to hint at it we're going to tease it see a glimpse of it the soundtrack will change like you get all the it's the anticipation building that anticipation of like what's it going to look like what's going to be like and like you know that dread that comes along with it i'm fine with that i guess i was just hoping for a little more peril and danger instead of like we're in a cave and we have to get through this cave and the tunnel and there's rocks and I don't know. Just felt like there would it'd be nice if it was a bit more that way. So uh yeah, it's sixty-five. Mm. Mm, so close. But it's good to know that I think there's plenty of uh I don't think this means that you don't do dinosaur movies. I just think it, you know, it's, I just, yeah, mm. it's a good premise. So uh, I did get to watch They Clone Tyrone on Netflix. It's a genre bending homage to the black exploitation films of the 1970s, featuring elements of satire, mystery, horror, science fiction, and absurdist humor. Um, the, I think, I think this is the director or screenwriter cited They Live, great movie that I used to pregame to right after college (laughs) with Rowdy Roddy Piper. Um, Groundhog Day. It follows a Napoleon Dynamite as influences on the film. Napoleon Dynamite is interesting because I did not get that sense at all. Um, Anyway, the cast features John Boyega as Fontaine, um, the drug dealer. I don't know why... uh, I didn't recognize John. I, I like, I, I know that guy. <laughs> it's just like, I did not put two and two together and think that's John Boyega. Um, and uh, I guess that's a testament to his performance and how uh, different he is. You know, I only know him from the Star, the the third Star Wars trilogy, Force Awakens, Rise of Last Jedi, Rise of Skywalker. So um, he was not that that clone trooper in this movie he was a full-on drug dealer and um gave a fantastic performance as did jamie fox as slick charles the pimp tiana paris plays yo-yo who's i guess i should say sex worker i'm not allowed to say prostitute or ho even though they say ho all the time in the movie uh and then there are some appearances by Kiefer sutherland and david alan greer good to see david alan greer I want him in all the movies. He's just so great. Ever since um, In Living Color, I've loved him. He's just so good. Yeah, so they call, uh, they mention this a lot in like the press and in the synopsis and the whatever that's retro futuristic setting of the Glen, right? There's a, there's like a filter they put on the the movie that makes it look like a like old school film they even have the little um in the top right the burn mark that you would see when it it changes from scene to scene so it's very like i would uh i would say this was 
a mixture of Sorry to Bother You, which I liked a lot, with uh, Lakeith Stanfield and I think Tessa Thompson and The Cannibal, allegedly, Army Hammer. Um, and also the dude from Beef. And also that guy, the small guy, Jermaine. No, Dupree. No, nah, that's not it. Um, so I had that kind of aesthetic, that kind of style, which I dug a lot. But it was not like, it, it looked like it was set in the 70s, but it was not set in the 70s. Um, and there was modern day technology that you saw throughout the movie. But so the John Boyega plays Fontaine, the drug dealer who lost his brother to um, a shooting. A cop shot him by, by mistake, quote unquote. And he has a mother that he lives with that we never see. It's just behind a, a closed door. And he talks to her through the door, like for most of the, those scenes. Um, so we never see her. So he goes to collect money from, first of all, he runs over a rival drug dealer in a car <laughs> with this little kid in the passenger seat that looks an awful lot like his little brother. And then he just full on like doesn't expect retribution. Like, I feel like that's where, you know, it's like, all right, I just ran over this dude. Like, he's just not going to, no revenge. Revenge is off the table. He doesn't have the balls. So he goes to collect money from uh, Slick Charles, who owes him money. He was played by Jamie Foxx. He busts in, looks through all his, his stuff, and then uh, is able to find some money, and he leaves. And as he's in the car, uh, as he's trying to back up, the, there's another car blocking him from backing up, so he gets out the car and he gets shot. And so the car peels off. So then, then, uh, then you see him... It's very, and that's where you see the Groundhog Day kind of effect kick in where like he like is str he's struggling to breathe in the car and he looks like he's like, <gasps> you know, like about to pass. Who is yelling outside? There's about to be a fucking shooting outside my apartment. Cool. So, <laughs> and then he like, you see the next he cut to him waking up in his apartment, like sitting up and be like <gasps> in a deep gasp. And you're like, okay, cool. Groundhog Day situation. He's going to repeat the same day. And so you're kind of thinking that's like the, that's what's happening here because he goes and does what he does. He does the same thing he did the day before, the same routine where he goes to the liquor store, picks up a 40 and some uh, cigarellos. And then uh, he goes outside and pours a little bit of the 40. And there's an old man sitting on the, on the, on the side with a, a styrofoam cup. And he pours a little something, something in there for him and uh, plays a scratcher. And says you lose, so he's doing the same thing. So you're like, oh, he's just repeating the same day. I mean, the title of the movie kind of gives it away, but <laughs> so he goes to collect money from Slick Charles again. Slick Charles is like, what the? How are you? You're alive right now? How are you alive? You just rose from the dead. And you want money? You came here yesterday and got your money. How are you alive right now? So he's freaking out. Fontaine doesn't believe him, and uh, ends up they end up calling Yo Yo in, and Yo Yo confirms like uh i think i remember walking past you in the parking lot and uh i heard gunshots i didn't see you get shot but then i saw the, the getaway car and so they kind of all team up the trio teams up and they play detective like the hardy girls it's the hardy girls hardy boys who's the girl that i don't know some kind of mystery series with a girl nancy drew <laughs> oh boy <laughs> So Yo-Yo is like a big fan of Nancy Drew. And so she, um, they end up uh, following some leads. Uh, they end up, uh, they were like, I, I think I know where that car is parked or where it belongs to. And then they, he ends up seeing this SUV that he saw earlier in the day when he saw there was like just a, you know, a guy walking down the street with like a gunshot wound or looked like he was bleeding and stumbling down the street. And a black SUV speeds up, screeches, picks it up, picks up the dude and takes off. He's like, that's weird. So then he sees that same SUV hanging out the, outside this house. They uh, strap up, right? They arm themselves. They go into, they bust into the house. It's pretty empty, like, uh, but it looks like there's a break room. Um, it looks like there's a, some kind of like a trap house. That, like they said, it looks like a trap house. Then they discover this door and the door is an elevator and they take the elevator down to find a laboratory with a, what they call a light skinned black dude. 
because like afro but like looks white but has an afro um that you would see normally on an african-american right and so uh they try to question this dude but they are also messing around with this white powder they take the white powder and it makes them to start to giggle and so as like jamie fox is trying to interrogate this guy he's also giggling and then Yo-Yo is trying to do something in the background with the beakers and drops one, and that causes uh, Slick Charles to to pop a cap in the light-skinned brother. So he kills him by accident. Um, but then that's when they discover uh, there's a body on a slab with a sheet over it, and that's when Fontaine pulls it back and sees, oh, it's me with the bullet wounds in, in me. So we're not in a Groundhog Day situation. Even though it is very, they it's almost like a video game with NPCs or like a Westworld where it's like okay, reset back to one. We're gonna do the same things over again. Um, that's what it uh, it felt like for a long time there. So uh, they follow a bunch of clues and, and leads. Like they go to get uh, <laughs> they go to get some uh, a meal at. Damn chicken, which I, I love that. I love that commercial. God damn chicken. So they go there and they start to eat and they all they start to laugh and they start to look around. So they see that like everyone else is laughing and they're like, what is going on here? And then you see like there's a hair salon where the they've been they're also you see commercials for perm cream or whatever, some kind of perm cream. They go to the hair salon and like this woman is complaining about all the wrongs that have been uh happening against her you know the the basically the system the fucking over and then the the salon what do you call that person a hairstylist i guess hairdresser applies the perm cream and she kind of like calms down and is like but it's all good i'm just tripping and it's just like oh okay so there's something funky going on with the chicken there's something going on with the perm cream and that's when you 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 start to find out that uh, they put it together that there's something uh, very sinister going on where like people these products are containing things to either control them or to dissuade them from uh, questioning their existence or questioning what's going on in the in the neighborhood. Uh, so they end up uh, going down into the facility. And uh, dressing up in disguises, they they access the facility through this time through a church because they were able to come across it. Uh, they were able to secure a key card. I think they got the key card from the manager of the goddamn chicken, who was also like had an afro but white skin. Uh, and then you you there was another part where like the liquor store clerk also has an afro with white skin. But so they they access the underground facility, the lab through the the church, and then that's when uh, they they throw on the disguises, right? The hazmat suits, so you can't see who they are, and then they go and they they discover like this whole warehouse room of uh, clones. You know, it's just like a bunch of Fontaines, bunch of Slick Charles, but no yo yos. So they end up going. Um, Exiting the facility th- through another entry point, exit point, which was set up uh, in the back of the, the like the backstage locker room of a strip club. <sighs> and while they were down the facility, they see all these different. They see that the perm cream is being applied, the the chickens being eaten, but also there are like cat, uh, sayings or phrases and music that these scientists are playing to control how the the people act the subjects act so like they play a fight song they fight they play a hugs like a song about hugging they hug so they exit through the strip club but the 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 dj who again afro white skin gets a message like stop them don't let them leave and so he puts on this song where everyone uh basically is under mind control and so the the trio yo-yo fontaine and slick charles make a make a, a break for it and they're running away and they get in the car and you see like the, <laughs> this is one of the scarier moments where like every they're like don't let them get away or something like that and you just see as they're driving away there's just like a mob of people running after them 
and it, the car breaks down. Um, and uh, I thought that was when stuff was going to get out of control. But then they all of a sudden they stop and they back off. But you can still tell that like they're still not themselves. And that's when that's when friggin' Keeper Sutherland shows up with a dude that looks like Fontaine. But in like like a Fontaine, if he were a chauffeur, a limo driver, looks like in a suit. And this is the explanation that I was hard to wrap my head around. But Kiefer Sutherland says that scientists like him conduct experiments on impoverished, predominantly black populations, including the Glen, to allow the operation to go unnoticed and supposedly achieve peace in America. Uh, he reveals that Fontaine and Slick are clones themselves, and he, and to demonstrate that he's telling the truth, he uses a deadly trigger word. I think it was Olympia Black, to get them to threaten others against their will, but also almost kill themselves. You know, like Fontaine is like, "All right, shoot her." So he like he's like shaking, but he's pointing the gun at Yo Yo, and he's like, "All right, now shoot yourself," and he's like puts the gun in his mouth. So. um you know, he stops it before that it gets any worse, but he's like, all right, I think I sufficiently scare them. That's enough of that. Like, you're not going to be able to get out of this. This is, this is bigger than you are. You're not going to be able to take this down. Like you are, we control you. And the reason why you live or you're replaced is because you keep this place dangerous. And if we can keep this place dangerous, then the white people, the richer white people won't come in and gentrify the area. And if they, and they won't find out about what we're doing here. So, uh, yeah, that's when, uh, Fontaine kind of goes back into his old routine, but then he discovers that he's like, wait, my mom said that before, you know, like I asked her a question and she said the same thing before and it seemed, sounded the same way. So he busts into the door of his mom's room and he sees just a recorder on a table. <laughs> that's his mom. Just a recording on a table. And so that's when he he kind of uh he goes outside to try and process things and the and the little guy shows up from before that uh he gave a ride to that was in the car when he hit the rival drug dealer. And he's like, You look a lot like my brother. And he's like, Oh yeah, I guess. So that kind of lightens him up. Um but then Yo-Yo, so Fontaine's like kind of just accepted it. He's like, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing like it's just it is what it is. And Yo-Yo is like, no, 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 I'm not settling like that. That's that's not who I am. You know, I want to work at the New York Times or something like that. And so she gathers all this evidence and tries to mail it out. And then she ends up getting uh, captured and taken, abducted. And that's when uh, Slick Charles and Fontaine team up. And they're like, they come up with a plan like, hey. You're not going to like it, but here's what we need to do. So Fontaine fakes his death. And that, that to me, is a little bit of a plot hole. You know, like, come on now. It's a little bit of a plot hole that, like, you can get shot and just lay there. They're not going to check your pulse. They're going to just zip you up, take you down, and not and just let you sit there on a slab. Like, they're not going to do a little more due diligence than that? Come on. So that was a bit of a plot hole, I thought. Um, and while, uh, Fontaine's doing his thing, uh, Yo-Yo, they try to apply the perm cream to her, but, uh, and so she acts like it's working and then they let down her guard and that's when she takes off the wig. She'd been wearing a wig, which, uh, she denied <laughs> earlier in the movie. I thought it was funny. And, uh, that's when Slick Charles gathers the people. So you see that. They go back to when the plan was initially being hatched, and it's like um, basically Fontaine has to convince the rival drug dealer that he needs to shoot him and say this line to make it look real. And then once they take him away, they gather his troops, gather as many people as he can, and then we're going to infiltrate the laboratory and take it over. So uh, the big reveal, which I... I don't hate. I thought that was an interesting twist. So, spoiler alert. Fontaine is uh, captured. He's brought to kind of uh, into this room by Chester, who's the dude who looks like Fontaine, but in a uh, suit. And uh, we find out that this uh, there's a scientist, and it kind of looks like 
an older version of Fontaine, but like hard to tell. And then that's when we find out that that's like the OG Fontaine. That's the older Fontaine, the original Fontaine who, uh, who offered his services as a, I guess, biogenetic scientist, right? To, um, to participate in this program whereby they clone um, black people and try to turn them into white people, <laughs> essentially, through uh, you know DNA manipulation. Like the, each, what I didn't understand is like, I guess yeah, I don't know, <sighs> yeah. And the, why? So why is he trying to turn black people into white people? Because um, what he so this the Fontaine clone has a lot of the original Fontaine's memories, but not all of them. And he withheld a lot of what really happened around his little brother's death when he got shot by the police. He says that he uh, describes the details of the incident, saying like, "I I found him. I took him to the you know, I took him to the ER, and uh, you know, if he were if they had come." to um, treat him in a decent amount of time, in the right amount of time, and the amount of time that they could have, he would have lived. He would have survived. But because he's black, they didn't value his life, and so they uh, they let precious time, minutes go by, and by the time they actually like went to treat him, he had passed. So it's like if, they j- if he were white, they would have treated him earlier, and he would have survived. And that was the the, the motivation um, behind behind him deciding to clone to do this just over the top extreme absurd program, you know, to turn black people into white people, and uh, the the um, the country would be better with assimilation than annihilation. Assimilation, not annihilation. <sighs> pretty pretty tough stuff but so fontaine uses the trigger word to get chester to shoot the original fontaine and then that's when uh they free all the naked clones they come up out of the out of the facility and the the news is there covering it and that's another thing where i was like it doesn't seem like they have like i understand this is a stealth undercover thing but if the Glen is this contained environment, like a science experiment, how are, how is news like? Hmm. <laughs> why are the new Why is the news there? But uh, yeah. So the news is covering it, and so that's when everyone starts. To, the word gets out that these uh these are clones, or that they're they they don't know that they're clones. They're just naked people like spilling out, um, and exposes the uh, secret operation. So they decide to uh, team up and head to Memphis to to stop the operation. Then you cut to um, a guy who looks uh, who it looks like Fontaine, but has a different like he's braided you know, as opposed to the kind of um, pineapple look he had <laughs> before. He's now got the the braids, the tight braids. Um, he goes to talk to his mama. It's just a recording. It's just the voice behind the door. So it's kind of like. Different environment, different house, but same routine. Um, you know, the liquor store, the forty, the the old man outside the liquor store pouring it out, the losing the lottery, you know, cigarillos, all that stuff that uh, Fontaine was doing. This this guy who looks like Fontaine is doing the same thing, but you see that he's in Los Angeles, and so he's uh, at his house on the couch with his buddies. Uh, smoking up, drinking, and they're watching the news, and that's when uh, the more clones come out in Los Angeles that the news is covering, and um, that's when the 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 reporter turns to what a, a clone, a Fontaine clone, and then they're all looking and they're going, "Whoa, that looks just like you, Tyrone." And so that's where the the title of the movie comes in. They clone Tyrone. Um, so yeah, I. I like this movie a lot. I mean, there are, there are some obvious plot holes, but uh, I think the critics liked it too. It's got 92% of critics gave it a favorable score with an average rating of 7.4 out of 10. 
consensus reads, they clone Tyrone's provocative, clever sci-fi with an exceptional cast. Metacritic assigned the film a score of 75 out of 100. And uh, yeah, I I agree. I would put it I would put it closer to eight. I think I did give it an eight, a ten. I could be wrong. No, that was quarterback. So I think I would give it a yeah, seven and a half to eight. If I have to round it up, I'd give it an eight. Is that good? I do. It's uh, it's in the vein of sorry to bother you, which I thought was was a cool way to look at things. Also sci-fi, an absurdist. So is praised for uh, sleek direction, savvy score, reliably funny cast performances, which I highly agree. Jamie Foxx was awesome. Boyega was awesome. Uh, the actress who played Yo-Yo is great. Uh, stylish, laugh out loud, blast. That is something to say, but doesn't sacrifice enjoyment to do so. While it may exhibit moments of unevenness, they clone Tyrone still makes for an entertaining rhyme with the potential to become a cult favorite. I totally agree with that. You know, like, sorry to bother you. I saw that four years ago. I still think about that like <laughs> once a week. Just uh, insane. So, yeah, I, I, I wonder if this is like the same universe type of thing, if, that, if that's possible. Um. Genre bending social satire, infectious chemistry. Huh. I don't know. Good setup. Too sketchy and conceptual to work as a bad dream thriller. Mm, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. So yeah, it's a that's a big recommend. All right. We're not gonna be able to get the TV Mets or Giants. So my deepest, sincerest apologies, but it's late. And this old ass got a slumber. So we'll cover that the next episode. You know, I finished Arnold. We'll, uh, we'll go over that. We'll do a review of that. Quarterback, which I highly recommend on Netflix, a docuseries from Peyton Manning and Patrick Mahomes. Uh, and then It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It, it was only eight episodes. So it felt short, but man, did it pack a punch. Probably one of the better seasons in a long, long time. Um, the trade that I am is coming up uh, for the Mets, so I might be able to talk about that next episode. But there are five Mets losses that really define the season, you know, with how they lost. So I hope to get into that next episode. And then uh, Saquon signed. His franchise tag. What the hell happened? What this, one of the most confusing negotiations, back and forth signings in Giants history, I want to say. I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So maybe next episode we'll get into that. But for now, hey, do yourself a favor. Treat yourself right, okay? Even if you are a clone. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. And we'll talk to you next episode. Adios, muchachos.